Hi, Matt Wheeler. Hello. So what socks do you have? I should, we should have started with, this is the shoeless therapist, or as I call him, the sock full therapist. Yeah, yeah. Hit me up on Instagram. I'm the shoeless yeah. therapist. So, um, you know, always love catching an extra follower here and there. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so here's my socks for today. Let's see if these show up. Um, I have- Oh, cute. On skateboards. On a skateboard. And like, there's some other things that I don't know what that says. I can't quite read it. And then there's like a little like lightning bolt type of thing. But anyway, it's definitely dinosaur riding a skateboard today. It's probably like um, written in dinosaur prehistoric language. Oh, That's why you no, can't no, read it. So totally right. I have to yeah. be. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, It was so funny. I actually saw a little comic strip the other day that was like, it was like this dinosaur was asking this person like, oh, well, tell me about the future. And it's like, well, you're all going to be dead. And oh. the people uh, who are the, the the species that takes your place is actually going to like fuel their livelihoods with your rotting carcasses. Right. Like it was actually I was sitting in like the dinosaur just gets like sadder and sadder. Anyway, it was kind of funny. That was not. That was not an uplifting story. Thanks for sharing. So, so, so I mentioned briefly before, and before we get started, um, we've got some special editions of webinars and things. So do watch the schedule. Um, specifically, Matt, we have uh, Debbie Allen is going to do one with someone who whose profession is, a, you know, is a fashion model and how her body image was impacted as a partner to um, someone who has struggled with sex addiction. So, so I, I, I'm, w I'm grateful she's willing to share her story. That will be on November no 7th. Another one that's a special edition, kind of in a series of things that we've offered. Um, Stuart Levitin, our COO, um, is also an attorney, um, and he is going to be joining us on October 30th to talk about some legal aspects, you know, some considerations if there's, you know, if there's a situation. We get lots of people who are um, in a relationship and and also in they are partners in a business and so there's extra complications if you're looking at even thinking about considering separating what does that look like and how do you navigate it so he won't be giving legal advice but he will be on to talk about some legal aspects and considerations that tags back into the um, one we offer with Deborah Doak who is a divorce mediator and she talks about if you're going to stay do it with integrity if you're going to leave make sure you're doing it well all of those things and so she just gave some framework for that so we've got some on on our website this and all of the other webinars are posted on our website uh, for consideration and you can always email me tammy t-a-m-i at seekingintegrity.com if you're looking for you know specific reference to uh, some of those but i was actually looking at our youtube channel the other day you know and and uh like some of them have had like um, one of them I looked at, um, it was actually in the series, we had uh, Kristen Snowden and May talking about should I stay or go? And then Debbie Allen did one with two partners, one stayed and one went, and they'd had like 2,600 views on that, you know, specific one. So, so there, there's a wealth of information is kind of my point um, that on, you know, that has been recorded, but guess what? You're here. We love questions. So, and I see we've got a question, but you have a topic too. So let's, yeah, let's start. Let's and talk, then we'll go. talk about my topic, but put, put, please put your questions in. I love the fact that we're already starting with a question ready to go. Okay, so I have, uh, I'm going to share with you guys something. I started creating um, a uh, diagram that showed like basically how the relationship is built. And I was really enjoying it, and but I hadn't figured it all out. And no lie, I run into somebody who had done it better than me. Uh, because they had finished it and worked with a couple other people and they've done it beautifully well. They actually have a book. Um, but I asked them uh, when I saw them present because I found this and then later saw them present and asked them, can I use that like in my presentations and whatnot? I'll give you guys credit. They have a book. It's called The Intimacy Pyramid. Um, I am not sure whether they come at it from like a specific like Christian approach or not. 
Um, uh, just to FYI, if you're going to look it up, that if if that is good or a deterrent for you, I just want you to be aware. Um, but I want to go through the pyramid uh, with people on the on the webinar today. Uh, let's go through this. I'm going to share my screen. Does that sound good? All right, I'm going to share my screen. Let's do this. Yes, and is this is this by Banyan Therapy? No, no. Oh, they've got uh, one too. Interesting. Uh, Dan Drake, who is a well, that's Dan. Yeah, no, he is. That, yeah, that's Banyan. We're oh, talking the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Good. Okay, I found it. I will put a link into this too. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So I didn't ask their permission today. When I saw them present like two years ago, I uh, or less than that, I asked them, "Can I use this in, in one of my couples workshops and whatnot?" And they're like, "Absolutely." And so I always try and tell people, like, if you like this. You'll get more information if you go by and read their book. Uh, but I'm going to start by showing you this. Um, okay, so at the bottom of the pyramid is the necessity is is honesty. We have to start our relationship. Our in order to have the foundation of our relationship, we need honesty. Now. Here's where I'm going to throw a couple of curveballs. So now, now that I shared that, you can see it. And I'm going to go back to the regular screen um, because we're going to break each of these down a little bit. Ah, that's not where I wanted to go. How do I? Un oh, there it is. Stop sharing. Okay. So honesty is at the bottom. Absolutely critical. Uh, if we don't have honesty in a relationship, we don't have the ability to uh, really connect. Now, the, I, and I tell people um, nothing will destroy a relationship faster than dishonesty. Now, obviously, though, the level of which our honesty and dishonesty occurs is will determine the level of which we can have connection. So I'll give you an example. If I am being dishonest with my spouse and I am not telling my spouse about uh, infidelity, right? That is a big level of dishonesty. Uh, um, now, I have said this on here before, that early in my relationship, I didn't understand the little areas where I was dishonest. And so I was dishonest in really silly areas. My wife would be like, have you worked, left work yet? And I'd be like, oh, totally. And then I'd grab my stuff and I'd rush off. And 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 I wasn't being honest. And it was limiting uh some connection for us because I didn't even understand where I was being dishonest and how and why. And so I will say that we need to be a little bit careful because if our if our partner is working on learning to be honest, they are going to mess up. They're going to make mistakes and have moments of dishonesty. And so there is a big difference between being dishonest about infidelity and being dishonest about whether they left work on time or not. And it, as much as possible, we want to be a supportive spouse and say, hey, it feels, it would seem to me you've been dishonest. Can we talk about why? What happened here? What was the dishonesty about? Right? Let's let's have a conversation and explore that together. Uh, I know sometimes when we've had uh, hurt happen, we can go immediately to you've been dishonest. That's it. I'm drawing a boundary. You know, you need to go uh, live in a hotel for a week, you know, and it's like, hey, can we slow it down a little bit and figure out what needs to happen here, uh, depending on the level of dishonesty, if that makes sense. I know it's a little bit of a dangerous thing to try and throw out because I can't describe what the reaction should look like when there's dishonesty. Uh, but first and foremost, it's important that we work on honesty, right? And it, like anything else, needs to be learned and improved uh, with insight and awareness, right? So if you look at uh, the pyramid, uh, it starts out, okay, if I go back to sharing my screen, I don't know why suddenly I feel illiterate on Zoom. If you look here, it starts out awareness authentic and assertive. Now in their book, they describe in detail why they've chosen these words. I would totally check it out if you want a better understanding of that. The next foundation of the pyramid is safety. 
And so let's talk a little bit about safety. Safety is one of the words that I've developed a disdain in for in recovery. Here's why. It's not because safety isn't critical and super important. It's because safety is really, in some ways, vague. So we, when we talk about safety, we get to like physical safety, emotional safety, right? We can start to define the necessity of safety and what that looks like. Uh, if I have a client who is being called names or, or physically abused or uh, is has the potential of being exposed to, you know, sexually transmitted diseases and things like we've got lots of safety that is absolutely necessary. Um, but there is a difference when, hey, uh, it feels to me like you lied and I feel unsafe. And it's like, we have to slow that down a bit and try and figure out um, what is that feeling of a lack of safety, right? I can feel unsafe, but then I need to spend time to get into the space to figure out what I'm, what the need is that I'm lacking. Um, but, but ultimately in the pyramid, you must have honesty, safety. Um, and then as that is, I'm going to jump into the next part here as I share and unshare. Um, the next piece here is trust. Um, well, and I guess I should highlight under safety, uh, the authors talk about the need for being responsible, reliable, and regulated. That I love it how they how they create that because if somebody isn't responsible, re reliable, and regulated, it is very difficult to have safety. So if you're able to achieve that, we move up into trust. Uh, and when we have trust, uh, there is commitment. We start being more courageous and cooperative as a couple. And like I said, you can explore their book sometime. Um, but as we have honesty and safety, we start to build trust. Um, and it, uh, if trust is broken, we, in essence, are in a way move down and go back to honesty and safety, uh, reliability and building trust. Um, once we, as we move up the pyramid, the next step is vulnerability. I'm going to share the screen again. All right. You've, you've got vulnerability. That's where empathy is at. That's where empowering each other is at. That's where we are expressive with each other. And then as we get beyond vulnerability, we move to intimacy. Now, keep in mind, I, I, people all the time use the word intimacy to talk about sex. Sure, sex might occur in the intimacy area, but that is far more than just sex. That is uh, emotional intimacy. And I love how they use passion, being purposeful and playful. One of my favorite things about intimacy is actually the ability to be playful with each other. Uh, because in order to be playful, there is a level of intimacy there that I risk being rejected from this childlike place where I am playful and silly and fun. And although I don't believe we need to, we can, that we need to be a child in order to be playful, I actually think as adults, we need to tap into that playful part of us. Um, I love looking at this intimacy pyramid and recognizing uh just each of the components that are necessary. I also think that let's say in one area of our relationship, we have a really full pyramid. And in another area, we maybe only have a layer or two of that pyramid as we're trying to build it up. So don't think of like, yeah, we can look at the whole relationship and say and figure out where are we in general, but also certain areas of our relationship, like in the finance area of our relationship, uh, our pyramid is full. We're really good in that whole area, but maybe in the sexual side of our relationship, we're not as good. And so we can really use that pyramid to break down and understand our needs better uh, throughout the various areas of our relationship. So Tammy, I, I'll throw that out there. See if we get any questions. Yeah. To well, and I appreciate that. I was just thinking when you were talking about that of like having it not be the universal, but having it be, 
you know, on topics. And, Cause I was like, well, but if I, you know, so, same thing, if I don't trust you financially, am I going to trust you sexually? You know, like I, I like I can understand where you can look at those pyramids, but it would also, I would think be eroding at, at the pieces of the uh, pyramid, you know, cause it isn't compartmentalized. So any right. thoughts on that? Yeah, it's tough because it always, it always depends on the couple, right? Like I've, mm -hmm. I've seen some people where they're like, oh no, I am so secure in our relationship financially um, because I, I have a body of evidence that shows that I can be, that even though we have issues sexually, um, I don't have any issues in that area. But I've seen it where, man, if you've got major issues in one area, oftentimes you have major issues in every area. So it, it is so unique to each coupleship. I've stopped coming in with the judgments and more just exploring with each couple where are the areas that we need to work on on these things and and sometimes somebody will be like oh no we've got really good vulnerability and the other partner's like i don't even feel the safety well that, right. that's what i was wondering about i was just gonna ask you that too is like like if you ask a couple like and hey, go color in your pyramid like where do you yeah. feel like you are color. like i could see them coming up with completely different like well i'm i'm we're not on the same page yeah. And it, and again, it depends. Like one of them, they could have had a conversation about finances last night and one of them still very unsettled. And the, and the other one is like, doesn't even think about that when thinking about the pyramid. And so, yes, we can both very much think that we're on, on different spaces. And that's part of what we're doing is trying to figure out where are you on this? Or I'm noticing hesitancy from you uh, or, Maybe you're, it seems like you're a bit withdrawn. Is there anything you need to talk about? Is there anything we need to, you know, connect with? And so absolutely, we can see each other in different places, but it's about going, oh, well, if you're down at the safety level, let me come down there with you and, and let's build back up. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's a really powerful tool because then you can be curious about where each of you, like, First of all, it'd be good if I know where I'm at personally, like if I'm looking at my pyramid, you know, like I may just be going, well, I feel unsettled, but if I go, well, you know, okay, like now I understand because I'm looking at this pyramid and, but then if my partner is going like, and this person's in a completely different level of the pyramid, that's the opportunity for us to, to navigate, be curious and figure out how we can build, you know, a, a couple's pyramid together. Absolutely. Okay, we, we've, we've got, got a couple questions coming up. We can we do. In. So the first one, um, uh, I'm the betrayed partner. D Day was 15 months ago. How can we believe our betraying partners loved us while they were betraying us? How could they do something like this and know they would hurt us so profoundly yet claim to love us at the same time? We get this all the time. Oh so yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so there's a couple of ways we can go at this. Um, Probably my instinct is to go at it from it. It's tough because I'm going to ask a very rational person to look at a very irrational brain, if that makes sense, because in, in its most basic concept, if you were to ask a child, right, um, mm -hmm. do you do you slap someone that you love, right? Like, do you hit somebody that you love? And, and a child's like, well, no, of course not, right? Um, and at the same time, uh, because you make something so black and white, you, we develop these beliefs that, well, if someone loves me, they would never do this thing. Well, what's difficult is, as we get older, we start to recognize that the world is way more complicated and concepts are way more complicated. But if, if we as a partner are trying to figure out how can I believe that they love me, there's a couple of things I'm going to explore. Well, one, what is their capacity to love? How much do they love themselves, right? Like, Brene Brown, I believe, is the one who poses that question. Like she poses a theory 
if I remember right, it was her, where she says, you can't love someone more than you love yourself. And, and people like revolt when, like when she says that, because there's a lot of people that are like, oh no, I love so many other people and, and I show it more than I love myself. But when you really dig into that concept, um, the idea that what if it's not possible to love people more than you love yourself? And you're in fact, trying to show people love as a way of trying to love yourself more, or trying to feel like you're a better human than you really feel you are. And so there's, I mean, we can get into the nuances, but let's, let's throw the idea out there of if your partner really struggles to love themselves, um, then in some sense, what if they didn't love you very much? They don't love anybody very much. They don't love themselves very much. But at the same time, it, they do have some love for you. And maybe even to their belief, it's a very full love for you. Well, a lot of times when I'm working with people who are struggling with out of control sexual behavior, they're not thinking about their partner. It has nothing to do with their partner. In fact, they're like, well, because I loved you, I kept it a secret. And I was going to take that to my grave as a way of protecting you. And it's like, wow, if this is your version of protecting me, please. And if this is your version of loving me, please stop. Right. Like because they have such a distorted uh, worldview on what love is and what it looks like and what it means and feels like that that a lot of times it's trying to understand how instead of making it about me how how did you get to the place where you could rationalize and do these behaviors it's almost like i'm going to pull myself out of it what you did had nothing to do with me and didn't even have to do with uh your love or lack of love for me how did you get to where you got how did you justify that Right. But but in order to go there and ask those questions, I actually have to be pretty grounded. I can't go there and be like in all of my trauma, trying to ask them, how did you get here and why did you do this? And because the truth is, I'm not listening to understand them. I'm listening to try and heal my trauma, which they can't do. And so there's this weird space where. When you understand, if you can understand this distorted, out of control sexual behavior mind, you start to realize, oh, to the capacity that they loved anybody, they loved me possibly the most. But yet, how could they love somebody and still hurt them? Well, how were you able to shut off your love for me and compartmentalize it and still do all of these negative things? <laughs> your emphatic head nods are amazing. Tara. Yep. Compartmentalize. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, 100%. right. Like, yep. but it's so hard because as a, as a reasonably healthy, reasonably rational person, you don't think that way. Like your brain isn't, you don't have to figure out how can somebody do such awful things and still profess or have or experience love within themselves? Well, usually it's because there's such a, a broken person. They're just trying to find some sense of comfort and they've got such a distorted sense of how comfort is really found in this world and really found in relationships that they it's that it's like they shut off that part of themselves to try and go and achieve comfort in such an un unhealthy area, not realizing the destruction and damage that they do. Now, keep in mind, none of what I'm saying justifies this. Mm -hmm. But but when people ask me, how can I believe that they loved me while they were betraying me? I think oftentimes that's how we have to recognize what was going on now. If I've had some people say, and, and this is an interesting one, um, they've said to me, I loved my partner so much, I actually went out and purposefully harmed them in these ways, hoping they would leave me. Because 
if I, and this one I've, I've always thought was intriguing if I hear it, which it isn't super common, but they're like, I did it on purpose because I want, I felt like they would be better off without me. Now think about how you hear that in other areas of mental health. Some people will like leave a suicide note and they'll say, I'm killing myself so that everybody else is better off without me. Not realizing how misunderstood that is, right? It's like, oh my gosh, you did this on purpose to hurt me, right? As a way of like trying to get me to leave you because you wouldn't leave me because you felt so awful. And it's like, okay, that's a very distorted view of love. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they still don't, in their own understanding, profoundly love us. And so this is where gaining this empathy and understanding, you I don't even think you have to stay with your partner at all. And you can still develop an understanding of how your ex-partner actually loved you while they did such hurtful things. I think most of our partners love us and they do terrible things. Some of them do terrible things. And guess what? That doesn't mean we need to stay. But if you're asking how, how can I believe they loved us? I think that is a very common way of trying to understand the, that broken mindset. What are your thoughts, Tammy? So, um, I get this a lot and I always say to a partner, you know, and I'm an addict to recovery. I've shared that really openly. You can't understand our brains. You, like, like it doesn't make any sense. You would never do this stuff, you know, but my husband and daughter have not known me in active addiction, but, but I remember the two of them were together and they kind of cocked their head one time and they went, you think different. And, and I was like, yes, I do. And, <laughs> and when I go to my 12 step meetings and talk to other addicts, we, you know, we understand each other, just like Matt said, there's no, this is not condoning any of the behavior. You know, the, 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 the challenges um, in our brokenness, we, we do love you. We do to the best of our ability. And, you know, I, I really don't know addicts that get up in the morning and go, yes, I'm going to intentionally hurt my partner. It is the maladaptive coping mechanism. And so you know, Dr. Rob just did a presentation. I was telling Matt, when we started, you know, and he did it on prodependence. But one of the examples he used is, you know, with somebody, you know, using alcohol. And, and I know for sure, like, this is a, a particularly vulnerable area when we're talking about sexual betrayal. But, you know, an addict that gets up and drinks um, and drives drunk and loses their job um, and is in jail, you know, a partner equally offended with, like, how did you not think about what this would could do to us and your family and all of us yeah. and, and it wasn't there's no thought of that it's like i'm going to drink because i need to numb out escape you know so it's a maladaptive coping mechanism again not not giving it any you know this is not justification this is a reason not an excuse um but but at partners you, you, yeah you, you i this can sometimes help if you look at you know at your partner as an under age 10. So let's say age seven year old and doing the best they can to navigate the world. And they found something that sort of works and it, you know, it helps them cope on some level and it, it kept working for them. Now it's really causing havoc in their relationship with you and all areas of the life, but that was the only thing they knew how to do. So stopping the problematic behavior literally is the top layer of things. But yeah, this is not like, Oh, I'm going to go hurt my partner. We end up hurting ourselves and you know, you don't have, to, you can have zero sympathy, you know, for this, but at the end of the day, you know, we are keeping ourselves away from real and meaningful relationships because we don't know how to do them but in recovery if we're really willing to do the work we can learn and we can have you know we can show up and not lie and we can you know we can develop we can create you know we can do our part to be part of a healthy pyramid like there's so much good in that but it doesn't diminish the pain that you feel as a partner you know who has had this happen but sex addiction isn't about sex. Sex addiction is not about, you know, any addiction is not about the other person. It's always about us and us looking for something else outside of ourselves to 
help us feel better in the moment. It doesn't last. And that's why there's a cycle of addiction. And we've got webinars on that because that it's just a vicious circle. We keep chasing the okay and it's fleeting because we also go, oh gosh, all the guilt and shame of like, we did that and got to hide it, that one too. It's sad because being a partner is a very patient um, and long process before often a long process before you have a equal partner, a stable partner. And, and, and that's a, a huge injustice. I see it every time. And I'm so saddened by the injustice that is there for a partner to be able to stay and say, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stick around and hopefully you heal and show up and become an equal partner. Um, and that it's so tough. It, 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 just like Matt said, you know, we talk about two to five years. Some people say three to five years. And so with all due respect, if you, if you are, you know, at 15 months and that's, if your addict is doing the work, like that's when recovery, you know, starts to take hold. I was traveling which is why I wasn't with Matt um, a few weeks ago. And I went to a, a meeting out of town, um, which I love to do. There's meetings everywhere. So I get to meet new people and don't know a single soul. And I know every single one of them. And this particular topic on the meeting, you know, I, I was sitting there and I was struck, you know, these painful stories of people that after many attempts at, you know, at getting into recovery, you know, it finally took hold. And, you know, so they're sharing. And I was sitting there thinking, I, I hate addiction. I hate addiction and what it does to people and to everyone, you know, in their path. And, you know, I'm so grateful that there is a path for recovery for those of us who are willing to do it. Not everybody is. So just like Matt said for you, stay or go, that absolutely has to be your decision. Um, and understanding, you know, one day at a time, depending on what the actions of your addict are doing to work on building the trust and honesty, you know, but, but recovery is such a gift, you know, like for myself, as well as everyone else. So, but, but it doesn't just magically happen. It's a lot of work. A lot of work. Okay. The next question as a partner, how do you recommend I respond when they confess to a small lie or get caught in one? A small That's, lie. No, like, well, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I talked about I talked about honesty, right? And I talked about at the beginning of this about how there are degree, if you will, degrees. And so I actually I really appreciated this question. Um so here's here's what's difficult. I think recognizing that growth takes time. Um, as much as possible, I, as a partner, am going to try to not be the gatekeeper to my, my partner's recovery, right? And, and, and I'm really, this goes both ways, right? But meaning I'm not going to be the gatekeeper of whether they are living good recovery or not. And if I notice that they, let's say they lied about um, leaving work on time, right? Um, oh, I, where did that example come from? I did that earlier, right? I know. That's what I was like. I think that's a personal life share. So. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> if if as a partner, I'm able to say, hey, it seems kind of obvious to me that you didn't leave work on time, uh, even though you said you did. I'm curious why do you feel that urge or or uh what's happening for you that you told me that when that doesn't appear to be accurate right because now i'm trying to get into their experience now they might be like well no i did okay now it, now it looks to me like you're being defensive and i really just want to understand because and I might even say this, right? Like, I know that you learning to be honest is going to take time. And like, I'm willing to accept that there are small lies that are going to happen. And like, I don't like it. It's not good for our relationship. But 
I'm just wondering, like, wh what was happening for you in that moment that you felt that urge? So now I'm getting curious about them instead of because their instinct is, well, you're the gatekeeper, right? You're the gatekeeper to whether or not we have a relationship. Because if I upset you, you're going to tell me I need to sleep on the couch or you're going to tell me to, that I need to move out or go to a hotel or whatever it is. And I think sometimes in the recovery world, when trying to learn healthy boundaries, we learn this weird like consequence um, that if this happens, then this is the consequence. And if that happens, then that's the consequence. And I've talked previously about how dangerous and unhealthy I believe that is for couples. Um, there's nothing wrong with me having a need that that if you have a slip and my need is I need some space for me to say, hey, I think I need some space, um, you know, whatever it might be, but I'm going to what my need is. I'm not going to your consequence. And so in, in any small lie, I'm going to lean into what was going on for you in this moment. T teach me why you went there. I don't feel, I feel like you've, you've been making so many changes and you haven't lied in a while to my knowledge. So why did it come up here? And, and now I ask the question knowing they may not know, they may not even have the awareness. And, and so then I'm sitting in, all right, well, Hey, why don't you think about it and let me know. And, and I can also say it does scare me a little bit because if you're lying about something simple, I it makes me worried. Could you be lying about something bigger? And it's like, and that may not be true. You might not be lying about anything bigger. Now, you might be, but you might not be. But that's the fear that comes up for me. And so if there is anything else going on, I'd love to hear it. But I get it that it, that's up to you. And so I'm not now accusing them. Oh, well, you, what else are you lying about? You must be lying. You know, tell me what it is, all the things you're lying about. Um, I'm going to actually just try and get curious and ask them questions um, and see what, what awareness that they have. I might even follow up a couple of days later. Hey, I asked you a couple of days ago if you have any idea why you lied. And I, you know, I'd never heard. And so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that since then. Now, if I'm the person who lied, I'm going to say, you know what, that's a good question. Let me think about it. And if I can't think about it on my own, I'm going to ask one of my buddies, you know, and I'm going to say, hey, I had a situation, lied to my wife about not leaving work on time. And I don't know why I did it. Can you help me? Can we explore this together? And so we're in now uh, we talk about it um, because I want to gain the awareness the only way that my honesty is going to change is if I gain and increase my awareness around these issues. And for me, I had to do that personally to figure out why am I lying about something so dumb as um, le not leaving work on time. And I did like if 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 my and I, I'd have to go talk to my wife because I can't remember, but I, it was always these little things. And I considered myself a very honest person. In fact, I have story after story where I was so honest. Uh, and, and, but yet there were areas of my life that I just didn't even realize I was lying. And it, it really took sitting with that. And, and for me, I didn't want to disappoint my wife. And yet, like, I'm, it's too late. I already did, but I was so afraid of disappointing her and her feeling like I was a failure because I felt that way about myself inside. And I had to learn to heal that inside of me before, probably before I really stopped the, the urge to lie, where I had to say, you know what? The truth is I'm going to disappoint my wife. Sometimes I'm going to not leave work on time and she's going to be upset. And I have to learn to be okay with that because I'm learning to be okay with myself. But that took time and, and, and a lot of introspection, introspection and a lot of healing on my part. So 
Tammy, any thoughts on that question? Well, I, you know, I, I used to be notoriously late. Yeah. Like, and, and so I, no, I, I really had to work on it. Cause I was like, you know, I am like, it is a self-centered thing. So like this particular example resonates with me, but it is like, I am making myself more important or like I did it. I was, it, I did it with work a lot, you know? And well, then I'm making whoever I'm working with more important than my family, you know? And, and so I had to, you know, I had to really work on that aspect and I do try now to leave, you know, earlier, or if I'm running a, even a few minutes late, I'm, I'm going to be, Hey, I'm, I'm three minutes behind, but I'm like that because like, I've had to work on that. I was thinking too, um, when our daughter was in elementary school, massive lie. Like it was like, you know, it was, I don't even remember what it was, but it was ridiculous, you know? And, you know, we talked to her and it was like, you know, you are like, it, she was in elementary school. So you're talking to a child, but it's like the, the consequence for you lying is going to be worse than if you had just told us the truth about whatever naughty thing she did, you know? And, and so like the question was, you know, if, if he owns that he's lied, you know, to me, that would be like, I wouldn't be happy, but I would also go, wow, that's different that he's showing up and saying something versus I caught the lie, you know, and this goes back to healthy boundaries. Like if there is, you know, if, if I, like you said, I don't feel safe, so I'm going to take myself over here and I'm going to take care of me, you know, and, you know, like we can talk about this later. There's always a, um, a gain in the lying, whether it's like you said, I don't want to disappoint my wife. I don't want her to be mad at me. You know, so there's fear or there's something, there's some reason. And, and I'm not telling on Scott because Scott has shared this on a webinar. So anything that's on a previously recorded webinar, I'm comfortable sharing, but he talked about like he shared in, in a 12 step meeting where like, we want people to be brutally honest and he was lying you know, and he had to turn around and say, what I just said was a lie. You know, and he's like, here I am sitting in a 12 step meeting working on recovery and I lied. And so that's, that's a level of, you know, I'm sorry, brokenness that we're dealing, you know, early in recovery. And, you know, if you start seeing progress, you know, like, you know, on some level, you know, what, you know, they're not your children. So it's not like they're in elementary school, but it's like, it's okay to go, you know, I appreciate you telling me it, it's much better to have you share this than, you know, than find out. And what is your plan so that you don't repeat it? I just want to know, you know, being curious yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, we're going to, let's go with the second question first. Okay. Oh, how do you categorize a lie as small? My wife says a lie is a lie is a lie. And yes, okay. on some level, but well, yeah, please. Well, let's, so let's, yeah. so I, I, I love this. I love this question because let's, let's talk about it. Um, what I'm doing is, well, actually, let me tell you what your wife is doing. What your wife is doing is please don't dismiss or minimize my hurt and concern. There's no such thing as small hurt or big hurt. My hurt is hurt. And so when I hear you minimize or dismiss, it makes me so angry. And you need to understand that your lies are painful. That's my guess at what your wife is saying. And she's not wrong. She's trying to say, Anything you do that minimizes or dismisses my hurt feels like I don't matter. And that's way too painful for me. And I would say I agree with her. Um, the What I'm talking about is us understanding that recovery takes time and that, that some lies are more hurtful than others. And sometimes we get so scared of any lie that it feels like this lie, lies, it's almost like I've got to put my foot down. Lies can't happen because any lie means that you could lie about anything. And okay, that, that's true, right? The issue is, is that as because recovery takes time, most likely somebody isn't going to cold turkey stop lying because they don't even have the awareness to understand all the areas in which they lie. 
right? Like I'm, I do, I would say fairly good recovery work. I still see a therapist regularly, like, and yet I am a therapist, right? Like, and yet I'm still learning about myself and my awareness. I was just exploring the other day, my tendency and, and the urges that I have to go into a victim space when mm. certain things happen. And like, if somebody said to me, well, victim is, is never okay. I'm like, you're right. But I, it's also going to take me time to figure out and, and I hope that until the day I die, and even if it's possible into the afterlife, I hope I'm figuring things out. I hope I'm gaining awareness and learning and growing uh, because that's what I think the, one of the joys of life is about. And so I'm, yeah, that we're not minimizing it, um, but recognize that what she's saying is is it feels like you are and that's scary and painful to her and she's 100 percent correct and lies of omission are still lies oh yeah and that's so, yeah like of, that's yeah. part of learning is that like maybe you don't even realize how often you lie because you haven't even gained an awareness of your lies of omission if I would lie in this sense, I would lie all the time by trying to manage people's emotions. Well, let me not share. They didn't ask about this information and I'm not going to share it because it's probably going to make them upset. But like I didn't lie. And it's like, no, if, if there's times where I had to learn, you know what, I'm going to share this. I know it's probably going to make you upset, but I think it's important because if you found out that I knew and I didn't tell you, then you're going to be hurt. And what matters more is you not being hurt. Right. So let's jump into the next. The, the first the question we just skipped is another really good. OK, one. betrayer here. I have been sexually absent for nearly two years. No affair partners or porn. My partner recently asked me if I had masturbated over the past two years. I admitted that I had on a couple of occasions while in the shower. I had been thinking about my partner after experiencing a connection, physical hugs, and emotional effective communication. My partner was very upset that I did not tell her that I had masturbated and I felt I was keeping a secret. I thought it was okay because I didn't have any desire to access porn and I didn't access porn. I don't want to keep secrets. Please advise. So, so this, this feels is, like the omission. The omission this is you the know? perfect example of a lie mm -hmm. of omission, mm -hmm. right? If my brain tells me I don't, that, like if I, this, this, this actually dives into a whole nother topic that I think is really important. And that is understanding relational agreements. And so think about this. I've worked with couples who, um, within their relationship, looking at porn, isn't a problem, meaning they know that one does it and they, you know, even if they're like, oh, I don't really love it, but it's not an issue. We've talked about it. And, and I've had couples. So then I, as a therapist, I'm like, oh, okay, well then how can I help? Like, like, well, they're like, but like, how do you feel about porn in the relationship? I'm like, it doesn't, it's not up to me. It, this is about your relationship. And so oddly enough, so much pain in a relationship is because of the relational agreements that have been broken, whether spoken or unspoken. So if if we are two individuals who come from, let's say, a cultural religious background where we believe that porn in our marriage is wrong, and we don't, whether we talk about it or not, um, but let's say for a second that it's even talked about, and then later one of us finds out that there's porn in the relationship. Well, that broke the marital, the, the, the relational agreement, and that's where the pain is. The pain is in the fracture of the relational agreement. I thought I could trust you, right? Whereas another couple, it's not a big deal because their relational agreement was different. And so what's happening here is that if you go to your wife, uh, I think it was wife, if you go to your wife and you say, hey, can we have a conversation about masturbation in our relationship? Um, you can say to her, I don't believe that uh, it breaks my recovery if I occasionally masturbate. Here's the, um, it's funny because I want to use the word rules, right? Like here's the rules that I Parameters. have. Parameters. The what? Parameters. Parameters. Here's the parameters that I have around it. 
if I'm not looking at porn, if I'm not whatever, right? Like if I, if, it, if it's not a, it, coming from a desire to look at porn, right? Like whatever, cause I'm, I'm looking at the parameters perhaps that you were setting as a therapist, I will say, Hey, that's fine. If you want to have that conversation with your partner, have that conversation. Now don't go do it per se without having the conversation. You need to have a discussion on what the relational agreements are. That is what she's upset about. She might, after having a conversation, she might be like, I don't like the idea of you doing it. Okay, let's talk about why, right? There is some conversation around, is that hers to gatekeep, right? Like we could have a conversation. Like you might say, hey, I know that you don't want me to. I still feel comfortable doing it. I want you to know what's going to happen. And let's have a conversation around it. Like have the conversation. That's the issue couples have. I'm, I am fine with a partner upsetting their partner by telling them things that they want to do or don't want to do within the relationship, but have the conversation, right? And, and that may seem and, a little bit scary. Go ahead, Tammy. No, but I was going to say, and if you guys can't agree, level up, go talk to your qualified therapist so that they can help navigate because because there's stuff going on for both of you. Well, I want to do this and I don't want to be controlled, but I'm fearful of this, whatever it is. That's right. the stuff to go work with your qualified right. professional with. And I'll tell you, I'm gonna, I'll give you guys a book to read that talks a lot about relational agreements and sex within your relational agreement. And if you don't read the book from the right understanding of what she's getting at, the book is terrifying. I've had several betrayed partners say this book was scary because it sounds like she's saying this. No, she's saying have conversations, talk about it. The book is called The New Monogamy by Tammy Nelson. And, and, and to a betrayed partner or to somebody who's struggling with out of control sexual behavior, if you use that book to justify, justify your behavior, you are doing it wrong. Look at the concepts that she is talking about and encouraging you guys to explore because you're wanting to figure out what the relational agreements are. It is not okay to lie to your spouse because you disagree with the relational agreement and you lie by omission. You need to tell your spouse, I'm going to live differently than you want me to, and I'm going to be honest about it, <laughs> right? Like, and, and that honesty, although scary, is likely what will end up saving your relationship because you're being real about it. Um, and so I'm going to tell you, you have to figure out in your own recovery, whether masturbation can be a part of your life or not. Um, just like alcoholics have to figure out somebody who, you know, sees themselves an alcoholic, they have to figure out what that looks like and means to them. Um, some people might say I can drink a, a non-alcoholic beer and it's okay. And somebody else says there's no way, right? Like as weird as it sounds, we all have to figure out what's okay within our recovery. Otherwise we resent and build resentment towards other people. Um, and I am in no way justifying unhealthy behavior here, if that makes any sense, Tammy. Well, and I'm going to tag on to that of like, and we don't decide in our own little brains because we're addicts. You know, so right. we talk to our, our qualified professional, we talk to our sponsor, you know, and Dr. Robbins talked about like if you're going to masturbate, like you you bookend it, you call your you call your sponsor in advance, and you call your sponsor after and process through it because that would be a recovery way to do it. And everybody's going, "What the heck? I have to?" No, if you want not, to do things in re, you know in recovery that that could be pr problematic, we need to do things like it. The same with a non-alcoholic beer, like yes, you're if, if you're. It with yeah. mindfulness you're not yes. doing it out of impulse and re reaction you're spending time to understand why am i doing this and what are my feelings and beliefs about it and i'm talking to my i'm talking to people not asking permission but just exploring what's what's the positive what's the negative how what are ways that i've thought and looked at this previously yeah yeah and and like with a non-alcoholic beer what are my expectations like so, so i'm an addict 
no, I hear you. I, I, I'm an addict. Like I used to think that B vitamins, like I would take a B vitamin and I'd have energy. Well, that is not the reality, but you know, I liked, you know, I liked lots of forms of substances and the pills were among them. And if they did something for me, that was great. Well, B vitamins don't, they, they, you know, like they're helpful and all of those things and they don't give me an energy jolt. So, so I always have to examine my motives for doing whatever it is. What are my expectations, you know, for, you know, for whether it's masturbation or, uh, you know, any, anything, you know, I have to be looking at, you know, like you said, it's mindfulness. What am I doing? I have to be intentional about, I'm, you know, I'm taking my B vitamins because it's part of my overall healthy regimen, you know, and I'm not going to go like, yeah, woohoo, speed. Okay. Next one. Um, my husband is sad about his addiction often and gets depressed. If I express that something hurts me, or if I comment that he may not be doing enough for his recovery, what is my role in comforting him? Ooh, I worry that comforting him will let him think that we are totally okay when we aren't. I also, uh, that he may not take what I say seriously. If I comfort him right after manipulation, you know, like, I'm sorry. No, but he can be, Ah, this is i'm sorry i i i hate this one because like this i hear this stuff all the time like what, oh what, i feel bad about down. my go ahead you, what you're mad you're mad at him right now oh yeah like i want you to take care of, like i've hurt you so you should comfort me what a great manipulation i'm sorry sure. so no okay so let, so i'm gonna slow this down a little bit thank what's you your, what's your role in comforting him um, your role in your relationship is usually to provide comfort to each other uh, at various times throughout your relationship, right? Like, usually that's part of the relationship agreement that we have is that we are going to comfort each other. Um, now, here's where I'm going to throw a couple of things out here. He's sad about his addiction and often gets depressed uh, if you express something that hurts you. My I'm wondering, is that actually shame? Um, because the truth is, is, if he's got shame around his addiction and he feels like he's a bad person because he's had this addiction in the past, that's he, he needs to work on his shame and learn to accept that it's OK that he had these issues because he's not a horrible person just because he struggled in these areas. And so he needs to learn to love himself um, and, and, and recognize that he's learning and he's growing and he's becoming a better human as he figures out how to be, uh, live a healthier life. Now, when you express that something hurts him, um, I'd be curious to understand what that looks like, but when you comment that he may not be doing enough for his recovery, I'm I, I, honestly, I, I have to be careful, but I don't know that that's your role to tell him that he's not doing enough in his recovery. I think what you can say to him is, um, I've noticed um, that my fear comes up. I talk to, well, I'm trying to figure out because you want to talk about what's fearful, scary, maybe even hurtful to you, but I wouldn't make it about his recovery. Um, that feels gatekeepy. That feels like you're managing his recovery. That's, that's not good for you or him. Um, in fact, you're going to stay in this quasi mother child role. If you're trying to take care of him and get him to live recovery in a certain way that makes you happy, uh, I, I don't recommend that. Um, I, and as far as the worry that comforting him will let him think that you're totally okay when we aren't, well, he might be okay. You're not okay, right? And so I think I would say to him, I can provide you comfort uh, and I'm happy to do that, but it doesn't actually, or or I'm willing to do that or I'm not willing to do that, right? It's totally up to you to figure that out. But I do want to make sure that you know that even though I'm providing comfort, I'm still hurting about this thing, right? Like, I know that I can provide comfort when I'm hurting. I can provide comfort to my wife. I can provide comfort to 
clients. I can provide comfort to my kids and still be hurting. What I have to figure out is, hey, I'm nervous that if I provide you comfort, you're going to think it's okay to keep doing this thing. So I can give you comfort, but can we also talk about how this thing still hurts me? Can we work on it? Right? So I don't know that I answered your question, but but pull that apart a little bit and start to recognize what are the things that are really about me being fearful and and how much comfort am I willing to give if I'm in fear? How much comfort am I capable of giving if I'm in fear? That's another piece. Um, but, and I, and I would just, I would also ask him when I comfort you, does it send the message that it's okay to keep doing this to me? Right. Most of the time when somebody asks that question, their partner's like, no, I appreciate the comfort, but nothing in there says it's okay. I can keep doing this thing to you. Most of the time, that's what I hear. But I do agree that if he is manipulating you to get comfort, that's not okay. Like, he, needs, he just needs to own that, hey, I have shame. I don't know how to work through it. I would love some comfort, but he needs to keep working on his shame uh, because if that's keeping him from showing up for you, which it will every time, he really needs to work through that so he can start giving you empathy and comfort. We're way over. So, uh, yeah, so... so uh... The, the typical scenario and and matt's right like i'm maybe reading more into this is you know i feel really bad about my addiction the partner says something and and maybe even you know is too much into the recovery process or you're not doing enough but then i go oh i feel so bad now the shift is the partner comes in and comforts me and like and I don't go to what do I really need to do? So yeah, the parent child, but also like I hear partners that are resentful at having to comfort him when he's, you know, his behaviors were the ones that hurt. So it gets, you know, like this gets to be a little, you know, um, unhealthy two-step. I call it the, you know, unhealthy two-step. We keep doing this yeah. thing and nothing changes, you yeah. know? So, so to me, this is healthy boundaries for you, partner. Like, you're talking to the wrong person. This person who's depressed and all upset about his addiction, that person needs, well, would benefit from really doing good recovery work. And guess what? We have a, an expert residential treatment program. Even if people have stopped the problematic behaviors, when they're, when this kind of stuff is swirling around, that's the, that's the work. It's stop the problematic behaviors, but address the underlying issues separately for partners. What are your healthy boundaries? Like, Oh, I see. I see you're now upset from what I've said. Well, I'm going to go talk to my tribe of of people. I'm going to get to my support so that I'm taking care of me. You go find your own comfort because like why I don't understand why it's automatically fair for a partner to have to step into. Oh, let me take care of you when oh. I've been hurt. Yeah, no, that's a tough one for sure. And I see that all the time. And sometimes it's unfair. And we have to do that as we figure out recovery. But ultimately we want a relationship where if I bring you my hurt, uh, you can comfort me. And if you bring me your hurt, I'll comfort you instead of making it like this. Oh, it, you know, I'm hurt. Well, I'm hurt too. You must comfort me. And then the other person who brought up the hurt never gets comfort. That's not okay. So we have to learn recovery so that we can both comfort each other and have an equal relationship. Healthy boundaries for partners changes things, internal boundaries, like I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to honor my boundaries. I'm not going to, you know, uh, like it. And, you know, uh, Debbie Allen did a great webinar on in June of 2023. And she talked about the three circle plans for partners. And, and for some, the inner circle is I'm t paying too much attention to what my addict partner is doing or not doing for their plan. Like that's their business and what they're going to, they're either going to learn or not. But you saying, you know, when you are, when I see you doing my, your recovery work, if you know that, like I start to be, believe that there can be hope and trust. I want to draw closer to you. That's motivating. Not, well, you didn't go to your meetings and did you do that? You know, yeah. no, that's, we don't do well with that stuff. So sorry, but Matt, thank you. We're over time. And I know that. Thank you for staying great questions everyone thanks for showing oh, up guys, and bringing the questions this is it. going to be posted to the website and we'll see you next week bye everyone, bye, everyone.